supervisor is Dr. Brown, and his committee members are Dr. Duplant and Malachi. Not <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. All right, today I'm going to tell you about background risk and neophobic activity in Hadri reared wild condition Atlantic salmon. But first, I'm going to tell you about the state of global fisheries. So fish stocks around the world are in decline. Up to 90% of the fish stocks in the world right now are either overfished or fished at their biological limits. This has huge implications for the two billion people on the planet that rely on fish as their sole source of protein. And this is where hatcheries come in. So hatcheries are areas where they actually grow fish and raise fish to release into the wild for a number of different purposes to increase their survival, their chance of survival. These are used for purposes such as fixing human disturbance, uh, restocking areas after overfishing, enhancing productivity, and maintaining biodiversity. But there's one big problem with our hatcheries. They have high post-docking mortality. In fact, in salmon, up to 95% of the salmon that are released as part of post-docking programs do not make it to adulthood. So that's only a 5% survival of these salmon. That costs a lot of money. At the end of the day, when we're dealing with funding and governments, money's what, what speaks the most. This is for two major reasons. One, these hatchery-raised salmon are not feeding at the same uh, kind of efficiency as their wild counterparts, and also because they just don't recognize the same kind of predators. It's a nice little hatchery system, why would you? And so we have to ask ourselves, well, why is that? And just like a, a child coddled in a nice little comfortable environment that's raised in a, in a good place, these fish are growing up in a bubble, part of the fun. There's just no opportunities to learn. So hatchery selection is, is leading to this, the, the selection for maladaptive traits. These are traits that would be beneficial in a hatchery setting, but once you take these fish and put them out into the real world, they can recognize these predators, they go for the first bit of food they see, and they get eaten. So how do we fix this? We know this is costing a lot of money, we have to find, our, find that way. Well, we know that fish rely on chemosensory and visual cues to assess local predation. Maybe there's a way we can hack this system to train these fish to recognize these predators. And this is where life skills training comes into play. So life skills training is, is another way of saying conditioning fish in the hatchery so they exhibit context appropriate behaviors in the wild. Or in other words, they actually behave more like their wild counterparts in the hatchery so that they don't die. <laughs> Current methods are cue specific. This is like classic conditioning, like Pavlov's, Pavlov's dog. If I went up to Dr. Ferguson and gave him a, a cucumber, and screamed at him, at him in the face every time I gave him a cucumber. The next time I gave him a cucumber, he's probably not gonna take it and he might flinch a little. This is the same kind of methodology that's been used so far for life skills training, but it showed decidedly mixed results in the hatchery. Some fish species, they're fine, they, they learn, they avoid it. Other fish species, they don't seem to notice. And that's where neophobia comes in. This is a new tool for life skills training. Neophobia, as the name suggests, is the fear of something new, or to give you a formal definition, it's the avoidance of an unfamiliar object in a familiar environment. The advantage of this is it is not cue specific. So in other words, we're not taking something that creates an innate response, or something that, like an alarm cue that makes you afraid, and pairing it with something like that we want the fish to be afraid of, like a predator odor. This is something where we're actually raising the background risk level high enough that the fish are always cautious. When they go into a near environment, they're just gonna wait around the first time they smell something just to see if it's bad or not. And this is shown to be more effective in hatchery settings. However, not much research has been done in semi-natural systems, and there have been no experiments assessing hatchery reared uh, fish once conditioned in the wild. So our question at the end of this sweet introduction is can we induce neophobia in hatchery reared fish in the wild for these life skills training purposes? And to do this, we went out to the to Atlantic Canada, this very idyllic looking river system here, the little Southwest Miramichi River in New Brunswick, and worked with juvenile Atlantic salmon. These guys are young of the year, so born this year. They're F1 generation, which means that they're the first generation born to a cross of two wild uh, parents. About eight to 12 weeks of age, they're fairly young, and they're hatchery reared, so they don't, they're, they don't know anything about the wild conditions. And in case you're wondering why salmon, 
Salmon are currently the most stocked species uh, of fish on the planet. Over half the salmon that we eat today comes from post-stocking pro uh, practices, and in places like the Caspian Sea and the Baltic Sea, all of their salmon is coming from these hatchery purposes. So it's, it's a very important fish for a number of reasons. So back to the experiment. So for this experiment, we set up four one by four meter nets in this little <coughs> Southwest River. Each net was filled with 12 fish, and half were given street water, and half were given alarm cue randomly over the period of three days. This is to establish a low risk situation and a high risk or high background risk situation. At the end of the three days, the fish were taken one by one and placed into a test bin where they were left to acclimate for five minutes. At the end of this five minutes, another five minutes of measurements took place where the variables of time on substrate and the number of foraging attempts was measured. At the end of this five minute period, either a novel odor or a stream water control was injected 10 centimeters upstream from this test bin and allowed to flow through this system. And another five minutes of post-exposure me measurements were taken. So this is again, time on substrate and the number of foraging attempts. And that brings us to our results. So it's paired in terms of high background risk environment and low background risk environment and separated either into the novel odor or the stream water control. The first variable that we're looking at is a change in foraging attempts so this is the, the number of times that the fish was eating before and then after the uh, novel odor or the stream water control was given. If the fish exhibited neophobia, we would expect a decrease in this behavior. I mean, it kind of makes sense if you're a little bit more afraid, you're not gonna be going and trying to eat the first thing you see. However, we did not find this to be significantly different. A similar me method was used for the change in time on substrate. So this is looking at the amount of time these fish spent sitting on, motionless on the bottom before and after being exposed to this novel odor or stream water control. And if these fish exhibited neophobia, we would expect an increase in the amount of time spent sitting on the substrate. However, this was not the case. And so there's no effect of this background risk level on the, these behavioral responses. And so what these results suggest is that neophobia was not induced after this three-day period. And then we have to ask, well, why might this be? Well, it is a highly varied environment. Previous research has showed that in a highly varied environment, the memory or retention window is much smaller. And so the movement within that three-day period from the hatchery to the wild might be enough that it creates a very varied environment. It could also be because of rapid changes in life history. These are young salmon, and other research has showed up to 20 weeks of age is enough for a whole lot of physiological changes to take place. Just like a child growing up, if, you're, if your internal physiology, your internal environment is changing so often that that might also affect how well you remember these, these cues. It could be due to social dynamics. If the cool popular fish are in the front and they're doing something and the less popular not so cool fish are kind of thinking, well I want to be like the cool fish, what do I do? Yeah, that could actually cool add to a bit of contribution <laughs> to our results. Could be due to weak conditioning as well. The, this is done in a wild environment with a fast moving river. It's possible that the alarm cue did not stay in that system long enough to actually have created a measurable impact or increase in the background risk level. They also could have increased vigilance but no true response. So fish do increase you know, their breathing rate when they smell something new, but these kind of behaviors are much harder to measure in a, in a wild setting than in a, a nice hatchery where you can and finally, and most importantly, it could be that it's just too short a time frame. We've seen that six days conditioned in, a, in the hatchery and six days conditioned in the wild are showing neophobia. And now we're working towards the lower limit. And at the lower limit, it's possible that three days is not enough. Perhaps, perhaps four, perhaps five, time will tell. And so what does this mean on the, the long run? Well, for commercial fisheries, if we find that lowest limit, it's a lot cheaper to run these experiments, it's a lot faster to run this. And this will be used in life skills training protocols. So essentially a boot camp for fish, we grow them in the hatchery, condition them in the wild, and then send them out into the real world, ready and armed to the teeth, and ready to take on anything that life throws at them. This helps in terms of aquacultures as well, because you wanna maintain genetic diversity to prevent inbreeding depression. If all your fish are dying, 
and you don't know what you're left with, that can create some real problems in your population. And finally, environmental rehabilitation and management of, the, of degraded systems. When you're restocking fish and you're spending that much money to do it, you wanna make sure the fish you put into that system are the fish that stay and they establish themselves in that system, as well as the fish that actually are colonizing and you know that this management program is effective. And so with that, I would like to thank these wonderful, amazing people, my supervisor, Dr. Grant Brown, and especially these two people right here, because how I got a 23-year-long 23 23 year grant to do all this stuff is really <laughs> so, I did something right, so maybe I'll copy that proposal for a future research. Thank you very much.